Sang Lim, I don't believe I've actually heard that name before. Welcome, Sang. If you've been here a long time, I'm sorry I haven't seen you earlier, but I think that's the first question I've taken from you. He says, another CSR actual episode would be nice. It would be, and it will be coming. Um, you need to know, uh, you don't need to know, it would be nice for you to know, um, what's really going on here in since really for the last couple, three, four months when everything suddenly became very clear, very clear. Uh, uh, Honestly, saying prior to um, three, four, five months ago at the top end, uh, I uh, I had um, thought that things like the movies were distracting me from the political work and uh, and one movie I should be doing this movie or that movie and so on. And then everything just became very, very clear. Um, get the office finished so that I can do the members only content, which we'll be getting to in a minute. Um, get these movies in order and do them in the right order. And the order is going to be Big Bet Problems this year, uh, 2015, uh, Common Sense Resistance the following year, and Aurora the year after that. It's perfect that budgets escalate, the scale escalates, the everything escalates, it makes great sense. Uh, nothing stopping us from doing the first one. So uh, all that just to say, saying that um, another CSR a uh, actual episode would be nice, but CSR is next year's project. It's 2016's project. That doesn't mean we're not going to do any. We'll do some for sure, but it's next. It's it's the next year's project. Now, with that said, um, we're about to put for sale just just to have. I don't expect to sell many of them. We're going to think we're charging like nine. Uh, sorry, five six bucks top end. We're going to sell the um, CSR actual episode uh, of the Stratosphere Lounge just so you can have an NSA free copy that you may want to just hand out to people. It's just kind of fun because that initial episode actually really had a lot of really cool stuff in it in terms of. Um, you know, uh, just some neat ideas. And, 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 and I hadn't read the questions in advance, hadn't given them any thought in advance, and it was great because it gave me a chance to um, develop some of these ideas on the fly. So we're just going to sell it just to do it. Uh, if you want a copy, needless to say, it's available, all of it in its entirety, at BillWhittle.com and embedded in YouTube. But if you want a disc, you can have one. Um, and part of that is to help us with the uh, copyright stuff, too. So uh, all that stuff is grand, and we're looking forward to that. Um, but we'll do another one for sure, and, and sooner rather than later. I would say probably by the end of January at the latest. If somebody keeps reminding me, I'm happy to do them. It was really fun. And we'll get off of that uh, beautiful set. We'll do it in the corner. We'll turn all the lights out. Although I have to tell you, turning the lights out is not, a big di it's not easy in here because when you turn the dimmers down on these overhead lights, you get nothing but um, glowing frames. And that has given me another idea. I, I think I don't think I've ever gotten out of the chair twice. I know I've gotten out of the chair once or twice before. I might have gotten out of the chair twice, but I'm pretty sure I've never gotten out of the chair three times. But I'm going to. And the reason I'm going to is because I'm actually curious now um, to see how dark I can get it in here without turning off the LEDs. So if you'll hang on just one second. Two quick trips to the incandescent dimmers. Yes, they're incandescent lights. They're burning filaments of um, tungsten and they are fantastic so let's see how dark we can get it and we'll just have the lights of the eerie led backlights hang on Uh, wish Count Floyd were here. Ooh, pretty scary, pretty scary. I mean, we need to um, bring up a little more uh, brightness a little bit. Sure, we're down or up. Yeah, so that's what it looks like uh, in the dark. <laughs> yes, uh, as a matter of fact, Sarge 56, they are contraband light bulbs. They are, in fact, uh, incandescent light bulbs. And, uh, yeah, well. I'll turn some of those incandescent. I'll turn the LEDs off too. We'll do it in a corner. It's a great idea, honestly. Um, honestly, saying it's a really great idea. So we'll uh, we'll definitely do that. Uh, so that's coming. Uh, and just remind me because I love the theme shows. Um, uh, Caleb Caleb Belchak is back. And he says, "What makes a movie franchise like The Hunger Games so popular? And what do we do to jump on that movement to get the conservative message to the culture?" Um, Common Sense Resistance of the Three is the most like a Hunger Games. Uh, and Big Bad Problems has some elements of them. I don't remember who said it. I saw it in the 
internet on the internet. Uh, so I can't remember where I saw it. It just came and went. Um, but somebody was talking about uh, Walking Dead. And I didn't get this quite right, but it's pretty close to this, I think. Um, this guy's quote was, When civilization no longer has any room for adventure, then the only adventure is the destruction of civilization. I thought that's really, really profound. All of these post-apocalyptic things, you know, Divergent and uh, Maze Runner and Hunger Games and, uh, you know, um, Walking Dead are, are games, are, are shows that take place in a post-apocalyptic future where something terrible has happened. And Game of Thrones is, is uh, w which I'm not much of a fan of personally, but uh, only because I compare it to uh, Lord of the Rings stuff. But um, Game of Thrones is also in a very um, pre-apocalyptic past. And what's going on here? And what's going on here, I think, is that society has become so safe, so safe, that there's no challenge. There's no room to measure ourselves. I think young men especially, some women certainly too, but young men especially watch something like um, Walking Dead and ask themselves, could I do it? Could I do it? Would I be able to make it? Would I be able to survive? Do I have the guts, the strength? Am I fast enough? Am I ruthless of en enough? These are kind of primal questions for men. And I think also that uh, also a fair amount of um, uh, women look at, at Hunger Games and start asking themselves the same question. You know, if I had to compete in a world against men, could I do it? Are there, are there strategies or weapons that I could use as a woman that would allow me to, to stay alive, defend myself? These are questions of societal boredom and society on decline. Uh, the Iron Phil, the Iron Pill, I'm sorry. Um, I think I got that wrong. I think I said Thelron Phil before. Sorry about that, the Iron Pill. Uh, just wrote a quick question. Said, could that explain the influx of Western fighters to ISIS? I think categorically that is precisely it. Precisely it. Um, it, it it's, it's exactly why ISIS fighters leave Great Britain. Because young men want to fight. They want to fight. And... Um, and they'll look for a chance to fight. And if in England, for example, you're a young man, especially if you're a young man of uh, Middle Eastern descent, and you've got two alternatives, and one alternative is a society that's got a death wish and basically says, we don't even have a right to our own culture. Just come and take everything you want. Be nice to us. Please don't hurt us, and we'll give you everything we can. Uh, and the other culture says, no, we're going to take over the world, and we're the future, and we're going to fight and die for a cause. It's not hard to figure out why people join these things. It, the the rise of ISIS is not due to a sudden extra malignancy on the part of um, of Islam. I mean that Islam has always been a warrior religion about conquest and 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 slavery. That's what the Quran is. It's instruction book for what you do with your captives and how to set up false truces. It's a war manual. Um, but why people are drawn to it is 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 because there's nothing in opposition to it. There's no there's no Western uh, crusade. Now that's the word. That's the only word I can think of. There's no Western crusade. There's nobody in the West who says, "No, our society is in fact far superior, and we're ready to fight and die for it." There are people that do that. They're in the U.S. military, most of them, um, and they they uh, go over there and and when they do engage these guys, they kick some serious butt. Europe is so much further gone than we are that uh, you don't even realize that. Um, that their soldiers don't get the same respect that we get. That's kind of shocking, really. But I've heard from several um, UK soldiers come to America and they see uh, you get to board the plane first or thanks for our troops or welcome home, this kind of thing. Uh, it's, um, it's shocking to them that we still respect our warriors here. It's a sign of a healthy society, or somewhat healthy society anyway. Even, even the Europeans don't get that. So. All of this stuff is related, and, and what it really comes down to is, since there are no real wolves at the door, and since we're extremely well evolved to either run from or fight foes and threats, uh, I think the popularity of shows and movies like this is be because it shows us how modern Western, really modern American people would do in a world with predators. It's really just that simple, actually. Uh, it's not even a political enemy. The great thing about The Walking Dead is they're predators. And people have, uh, and I'm one of these people, by the way, and people have a kind of aversion to hurting animals. Even animals are coming after you like wolves. I mean, I'd shoot a wolf if I had to. 
needless to say. If, uh, if somebody was, if a wolf was coming after me or people I cared about, I'd shoot a wolf. If I had to, I'd shoot it in a heartbeat, but I wouldn't enjoy it. it wouldn't be, yeah, I mean, wolves are beautiful creatures. And, and I think the reason that The Walking Dead is so popular, especially, is because nobody feels bad about shooting a zombie. He's already dead. The great thing about a zombie is he's trying to kill you, and um, in a horrible way, he's actually trying to eat you. And when you get down to the bare brass tack essentials of zombieism, he's trying to eat your brain. So in other words, he's trying to eat what makes you human. He's trying to eat your humanity. Um, and you can blow zombies away with shotguns at point-blank range, and there's nobody going to go, oh, it's really unfair and uncool. It's like, no, he's already dead anyway. It's a perfect villain, really. He's a perfect villain, a zombie. If you just want to kill him, he's damn near as good as a Nazi. Um, and uh, so so what, what Walking Dead does, and to a somewhat lesser degree, but the same dynamic with Hunger Games and Divergent and all the rest of this stuff, is they show modern people a situation where they would have predators and life and death conflict. And the great thing about these movies is that they don't really show us what future people would be doing in those situations. They really show us what we would be forced to do in those situations. That's a great premise of The Walking Dead, right? I mean, the guy's in the hospital for surgery, wakes up, and next thing you know, he's starving to death, and he's been uh, you know, in a medical coma or something for a couple, three or four, five days, eight days, whatever the number is. He wakes up and, what? Hello? That's how we would imagine ourselves, you know, we want to wake up in that world and see how we do. So, uh, yeah, there you go. I think that's really it. And I think that Big Bat Problems has that going for it that same dynamic. That's why I think it's going to be very popular. In fact, I didn't really give it quite quite this much thought before on quite this exact point, but when you get right down to it, Big Bat Problems about an American brothers, two, two kids in America, an uh, older brother and a younger brother, who have to team up with other Americans who've also encountered this threat, and they themselves take on the responsibility of tracking down these things and killing them, not just defending themselves because these encounters are very unlikely, they decide, well, we don't want other people to go through what we went through, so we're going to go find these things, we're going to track them down and kill them. That is uh, a threat. That is a movie about how modern people, modern American people, would deal to deal with the idea of predators in the ecosystem because these big bats are predators. And the thing, I've, like I said, I never really quite thought it through along these exact lines before, but it's really kind of noble, isn't it, really, when you get right down to it? It's what you want to do, isn't it? You'd want to say to yourself, okay, this kind of a, hey, I almost want a show without mentioning it, and I'm going to. It's a certain letter kind of characteristic, isn't it, to go out there and remove the threat rather than just run from the threat. In other words, there's a predators in the ecosystem, so instead of us just running and hiding, let's not only not run and hide, let's go find out where they are and kill them so that the other letter people don't have to worry. It's kind of cool, and that's exactly what they do in uh, Big Bad Problems. So I think it's right on point in terms of the dynamics of the culture. That makes me happy.